this is going to be the the close up view of of Sarah's discussion, um, focusing on the events here within the Pennsylvania and New Jersey chapter and how we're uh, kind of emerging back into the the involvement with um, volunteers and members this year and where what we've done this year and where we're we're headed in the the immediate years to come. Uh, so a quick rundown, our field season starts with the greenhouse planting in late January, early February, and things progress into a period of, of grafting and then controlled pollinations, inoculations, fall planting, harvest, and then uh, kind of throughout this when we have um, periods in between activities, the, the roguing is kind of a, a constant effort. Um, this photo is taken of the, the Arboretum Orchards here at Penn State, um, looking at what we call the, the South Orchard. Um, and that's the one we, we generally do a lot of the tours and a majority of activities currently. Uh, so our greenhouse planting this year, um, still trying to, to figure things out with the pandemic of how we can engage folks and, and what activities we can really use volunteers and members for um and thankfully we were able to to do this in early february this year set up our you know socially distanced stations and we're able to plant a variety of things a majority of it was material for a resmap trial um that we're working on and i'll explain that a little more in depth in a minute um but we ended up planting over 2000 seedlings this year uh 900 of them were for that specific project and then a variety of um, american seedlings and b3 f3 material that came both out of our orchard here at uh, penn state and uh some material from meadowview <clears throat> uh that took us into the march april time frame and this is kind of the, the brief lull before field season really gets started and it's a good time to work on grafting. Um, I will say that I am a novice at grafting. I'm trying to gain more and more information and knowledge and expertise in this area. If folks have an interest in grafting, um, please reach out to me and we can <laughs> figure this out together because it seems like the, the more folks we have involved and engaged, um, the better off we're going to be. It is still specifically for chestnut, definitely a, a learning process. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of uh, trial and error, and I will talk about our, our success and our, our failure, um, but it, yeah, a lot, to, a lot to learn. So this is um, just a, a good example of a commercial grafting scenario. Uh, this is out of Forest Keeling Nursery in Missouri. They are dealing with kind of ideal uh, situation where they're taking really excellent performing hybrids, Chinese hybrids uh, for nut production. And they're able to go out and select really healthy scion wood at the precise time, um, which is December into early January when things are completely dormant. They have their, their choice rootstock that they're working with. And that's kind of that second image from the left with the knife embedded in it. Uh, and it just, it shows a really good example of they're able to, to get matching material and get things to, to work out really well. And I can't emphasize that enough of like, your starting point makes a, a big difference in how things progress. Um, and this is what we're, we're working with for our grafting material and what we're trying to do where as Sarah mentioned, we're trying to take material from wild American trees that may not pr be producing nuts. And we're uh, trying to bring that material to a, a GCO, a germ plasma conservation orchard, or just to try to propagate it in a more controlled setting where maybe that tree can exist beyond the, the suppressed um, multi-stem state that it currently exists in in the, in the forest. and become a tree that's producing uh, nuts over the next few years. So 
you will see a lot of graphs um, similar to this top left where it is a uh, rootstock uh, containerized seedling. Um, and these are a variety of material. A lot of it's American. Some of it is B3, F3. Uh, so our, our more advanced um, blight resistance material that doesn't have quite the form we would like it to for ceremonial planting. And rather than compost it, we're repurposing for grafting or, or things of this, this type of use. So this really small uh, scion that is sticking out of the, the cut stump, cut um, sprout, that's what a lot of our grafts are. And it's small material, uh, it's very delicate and timing is very important. So just a couple images on the left-hand side there of you know, we're, we're making these grafts, we're covering them with parafilm and grafting wax. And then ideally uh, they, their buds swell and, and break dormancy in the spring. And if we're lucky, it looks like this on the, the right-hand side where this is a successful graft. Um, you can see the, the graft union there on the, the bottom part where it was um, just, kind of worked its way into, into the sprout um, and is continuing to grow. So this one was specifically a uh, American rootstock, that PNCE tag on the right, and this tag on the left denotes the, the scion material, which this was a, a Pennsylvania derived scion. Um, so we did about 300 graphs and unfortunately our success rate was really, really low, um, ended up having about 10, 10 stems that survived and overwintered. Um, so nice low bar to, to improve upon next year is, is how we're looking at it. Uh, and then we moved into pollination prep. So Sarah mentioned doing controlled pollinations and we're putting a lot more focus on that this year. And that required some additional uh, regulatory requirements that we needed to meet. And one of those was for all the controlled pollinations with transgenic pollen, we were required to create these uh, rodent proof, rodent exclusion bags out of um, aluminum screen. So uh, we got a, about five volunteers and over 30 hours of their time plus some staff time. Uh, and that created an initial 600 screens and uh, Beyond that, it was a lot of uh, stapling and taping and cutting screen um, over and over and over again. So we had about 3,000 feet of aluminum screening to, to cut down and make these bags that were about 18 inches by 24 inches. And they're, they're meant to go over the pollination bags and exclude the squirrels and the blue jays and other critters from stealing the, the potentially transgenic nuts that we were hoping to create. Uh, from there, we moved on into inoculations in June and had a, a really nice turnout of 15 volunteers and performed about 2,200 inoculations. That was uh, in the orchards here at Penn State, uh, as well as Racetown and House Rock down in Lancaster County, uh, and the ResMap seedling. So the ResMap was a multiple site uh, trial where we took the same material, which was totaled about 995 seedlings. And that was everything from our controls to uh, B3F3 material out of the Arboretum and a variety of material outside of those. Uh, and the purpose is to perform a small stem assay, which is uh, in this slide, the, the bottom photo with a small seedling standardizing the process, inoculating these uh, trees at a young age, and then hopefully being able to compare results across four other sites and come to a consensus on um, the methodology, the results, and how to use that material moving forward. So this happened in June. The, the next steps in it were to uh, collect data on that material, uh, which we did in October, and then that those surviving seedlings are going to be planted out in the Arboretum and the standard field inoculations like the, the image with Dave here on the right will be performed on 
those same seedlings in three to four years. Uh, and the hope is that, you know, we'll have a large data set. We'll be able to compare and confirm the results of the ResMap trial whenever they're at a young age. And then we'll have, you know, supporting data of uh, the results in four or five years, whenever we can inoculate the seedlings again and take data on those results. Uh, and then we moved into kind of the the mad dash for the for the year with pollinations. Um, anyone that's done performed pollinations in the past, you know, it's a bit of a, a hurry up and wait, and then hurry up as fast as you can. Uh, so. We spent the later part of June and, and first part of July watching flower development um, and trying to navigate the, the timing um, required for pollinations. They're a, a fairly narrow window and it requires a lot of um, preparation and then just dedication for the, the window when it arrives. Uh, that image is uh, Sarah about 40 feet up in, in the lift applying pollen to one of the one of the female flowers that we bagged we ended up getting over 1000 bags placed on 37 trees uh, and <clears throat> pollinated those with six unique pollen sources provided from Syracuse University in New York as well as University of New England um, and it resulted in 3944 seed seed that we have yet to test, but hopefully, you know, we fall within that percentage that Sarah described of 41% will be positive for the transgenic uh, material, and then we'll be able to distribute that and grow it out for uh, production. So in this, uh, just a nice variety of, of shots from the orchard with bags being placed and, and the aluminum bags covering them and what we're working with it. It's a little, it felt a little like magic whenever you're, you're up in a tree, you're 40 feet in the air and you have this glass slide that you can kind of see, it looks like dust almost. And you're gently wiping that against the, the female flowers, just kind of going, I hope I'm doing this right. Uh, I can't necessarily see a difference. So it's a little bit of faith and a little bit of um, <laughs> having confidence in the science. And obviously we got, we got seed. So uh, we're, we're optimistic and it feels a, a little better to, to see that end result in the fall of, okay, we don't just have a bunch of empty bags. So that's a, a good feeling. Um, uh, and then in September, we, we did our first, uh, GCO planting here at the Arboretum. We converted one of our, uh, in, initially it was supposed to be a continuation of our back cross orchard. And then uh, with some of the developments that we didn't need the, the nine replications of the 20 plots from uh, our original um, science plan, we were able to take that space and reallocate it for germplasm conservation. So we ended up planting a hundred different seedlings from uh, 14 unique lines, so 14 individual mother trees from a total of five states. So we had uh, material from Michigan, New Jersey, Wisconsin, New York, and Pennsylvania. Uh, so that was an excellent start. We're hoping to continue planting in that area for the years to come. Uh, we have space for about 50 unique lines right now. Uh, may be able to improve that moving forward. So you know, some of those areas that are underrepresented from Sarah's maps earlier, uh, those are places we're going to put an emphasis in, you know, to finding more material and, and collecting seed if possible, as well as collecting scion wood and creating successful grafts that can go into those, that orchard as well. Uh, and then we moved into harvest. Uh, so this really took up the, the end of September into early October. Uh, we had excellent assistance from, from Bartlett. Uh, they donated the use of their 70 foot bucket truck and a couple uh, employees for the day. And they spent, <laughs> this is what they felt was the most efficient method of, they had a guy up in the bucket, just pulling down burrs in the, 
the ground guy was scooping them up, kind of reminiscent of those historical images where you just had chestnut burrs littering the ground and kind of a, a nice um, look at what the potential could be moving forward as you know we increase production, we increase our our chestnut uh, burrs and and go back to to days of old. So that gets us to the burrs, uh, but they still need to be shucked. So we had a bunch of volunteers. We had a couple days of being out in the orchard with excellent weather and and shucking burrs. Um, good community involvement. We had twelve volunteers come out, and we still have a a fridge just packed full of material to inventory and uh, do some various testing on and distribution. So if you're in State College and you feel compelled that you want to count um, tons and tons of chestnuts, please feel free to reach out. Let me know that you're interested and we can we can surely accommodate that. Um, and any any questions you guys have moving forward you know we're going to be more into the the farm show the presentation time of year where we can hopefully engage with more of the public and get some more interest in in what we're doing locally and for the the national organization uh our next activities as i mentioned we're going to be doing a lot of inventory and then in late january we'll be looking to to start our greenhouse planting again this year so uh, look forward to those those outreach notifications and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing folks in the future. Um, I see Rick had one mention in the chat here of the weevil issues. Yeah, so we are seeing um, an increase in, in weevil activity in the orchards here at the Arboretum. Uh, we do, through a grant that just wrapped up, we created a uh, mobile hot water processing unit, and that's for weevil control. So we'll be looking to, to implement that, you know, for years to come uh, to try to keep those, those population levels in check. Um, we may, well, we will look into uh, options for pesticide or insecticide application if levels get too high, but for now we're, we're really hoping since the nuts are going more for research and not for consumption, uh, we'll use the hot water bath and treat the nuts prior to putting them into storage. And that should uh, kill off the, the larvae in the nuts and uh, reduce you know, the population level, keep them from, from getting too high and, and really destroying the, the seed that we're creating. That's really all I have. There are 